Welcome everyone. I am Kayla Williams with the Murray County Chamber and Economic Alliance. And uh, part of what we do as an organization is advocate for our membership uh, with public affairs. Um, and one of the things that we always do during an election year is we offer the opportunity uh, to meet candidates uh, for uh, certain elected uh, officials. And uh, due to the pandemic this year, we are doing our format a little bit differently this year. So our candidate interviews and our candidate forums will be virtual this year. So um, I am pleased to introduce uh, Scott Sapicki, and he is a candidate for our Tennessee State Representative District uh, 64. So Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm sorry that we couldn't have an in-person candidate forum um, in our traditional sense, but we are delighted to have the opportunity to get to talk with you today. So thank you so much for joining us. Karen, it's my, my pleasure to always talk to the Alliance. All right, thank you so much. Well, we're gonna start, um, uh, of course, at the beginning and um, a pretty easy question to start us off. If you would, Scott, tell us about yourself, um, a little bit of your background and um, why you are running for uh, state representative with the District uh, 64. Appreciate it, Kara. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for being on here today. Um, my name is Scott Topicki. I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. I uh, went and graduated from the University of Wisconsin. I was a dual, dual sport athlete up there, played professional sports in baseball and football, and then uh, moved back into Middle Tennessee, I guess about 12, 13 years ago. And I've been in Murray County, I think, since 2009. Um, my wife, Teresa, and I have been married for 23 years. We have two boys, Gabriel and Daniel. Uh, Gabriel is now 15, and Daniel, Daniel is 12, one in uh, freshman in high school and the other one is a uh, seventh grader. Uh, got involved in politics back in 2010 on the county commission, uh, where I served there for four years from 2010 to 2014. Uh, 2010 to 2012 was chairman, and it was during the great, the height of the Great Recession, which Murray County was very financially strapped. And uh, Carrie, you've been around since then for sure, and you know what the downtown Columbia looked like. We were more focused on just trying to keep the lights on and keep Murray County open. And now we segue to 2000 uh, to 2020, where we see where Murray County is, both economically and growth in the state of Tennessee. And that's been one of our main challenges in Murray County is growth and how to uh, mitigate those costs. I'm running for District 64, running for re-election as your state representative. Uh, I've taken a big lead up here in education in Tennessee. I think that is the key to our success. Uh, we have to fix K through three and get our kids reading and writing and doing math on grade level. I think if we can accomplish that task here, we're going to solve a lot of our shortcomings uh, later on in life. And uh, we know we've got other issues with broadband and infrastructure as Murray County continues to grow. And uh, COVID-19 has thrown everybody a curveball. But I think we've done the best we can to um, mitigate that, especially in Murray County, to keep the doors open as best as we can. So I'm hoping everybody will see the, uh, the fruits of our labor so far and can send me back up there for another term. Thank you, Scott. Yes, it, it is kind of amazing to see the transition that's happened over about the last 10 years. Um, and believe it or not, if you look back even further than that, it really is amazing. So, and you bring up a good point. Uh, you were talking about uh, uh, broadband and internet services, and that leads me right into our second question. So since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, more and more people are dependent on internet services for school and for work. Um, and the need for statewide broadband has, has accelerated quickly. Um, if elected, um, what action uh, would you take to, have, uh, to increase the internet capacity for Tennessee, especially in rural Tennessee? That's a great question. And you know where we sit with, with COVID-19 and a lot of our students being restricted to uh, at-home virtual learning, uh, the ones in Tennessee, not only in Murray County, but across Tennessee that don't have that option, we're going to see a tremendous learning loss. So COVID-19 has accelerated the need for broadband access, not only in Murray County, but across all of its rural counties mm -hmm. to make sure our students have the uh, connectivity to be able to, to get better teachers. The other problem we have with broadband and internet access is uh, in economic development, one of the things that uh, businesses look at is, do I have the ability to get online and, and, and conduct business via the web? 
most of our most of our companies right now are taking advantage of that right now if you want to stay at home you can get your groceries delivered to you you can shop at walmart you can obviously shop at amazon and and other, and other online things so we've got to have the ability for our citizens across murray county and tennessee to have that advantage and also to attract businesses to these smaller rural communities and economic development. We see what Murray County is doing with the Innovation Park on the north side, trying to bring businesses mm -hmm. here. We saw Columbia with, with their industrial park, and now we're seeing the fruits of labor down in Cherry Glen. Of we, we have to provide internet access and broadband accessibility, not only to our citizens, but the ability for businesses to come to Murray County and therefore, instead of people having to drive up to uh, Franklin or in the Nashville for good paying jobs, uh, economic development can bring those jobs back to Murray County where people can spend less time traveling back and forth and mostly spending their money outside of our county, spend our money here in Murray County to help drive revenue. Right. Uh, yes, yes, you bring up some really good points. So, um, yeah, the ability to work from home uh, is certainly um, a, a big change that we're seeing in, in the, the more we can keep jobs here locally, the, be, the better we're all going to be. So um, with the in, increased use of home-based work in school, there's a growing concern uh, around our broadband and our working from home about cybersecurity and personal privacy. So what policies does our state need to implement um, to protect our privacy as citizens using internet services at home and ensure that our electronic data is secure? That's, a, that's an even uh, a broader question and, and bigger topic. Uh, there was an issue that popped up back in March in Williamson County school system that an, 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 an unintentional consequence of allowing students to have access to a, a World Wide Web portal led to some um, unsavory material that the students could get their eyes on. Uh, we, able, we were able to correct that with the Secretary of State by putting more filters on there uh, at Williamson County level to make sure that they couldn't gain access to that. Um, we also know that there are always people, hackers out there trying to gain uh, entrance into our systems. We have a very robust firewall uh, up at the state. The, uh, the iPad that I'm talking to you on right now is a state provided iPad and it has all kinds of firewall security on it on there to prevent people from gaining access into our information. Um, with more and more people being online, more and more people typing in passwords, there's opportunities for hackers to get in there, not only to gain entry into your personal information, but to gain entry into bank information and things like that. So we've got to make sure that we have a state-of-the-art uh, 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 a state department that deals in cybersecurity that they can they can partner with our local counties and local uh, municipalities to provide the support that they need so that we can make sure that when you're online your information is protected and also your business's information is protected along along with your with, with your trade secrets too yeah excellent point so i i don't think we've heard the last of our needs for broadband no. security no. going to be an on going to be an ongoing issue now we're going to get into something that I know is near and dear to your heart. So the State Department of Education has recognized the learning gaps uh, and delays among our school students uh, due to uh, COVID and learning from home. How can uh, the legislator address the gaps and shortfalls in academic achievement that our students has, have suffered recently due to the pandemic? Super question. So as we got into March, uh, we know one of, the, one of the problems we have is third grade literacy. Uh, third grade literacy is about 37 percent in the state of Tennessee, but the big number that nobody talks about care is eighth grade. It drops to 28 percent. Wow. But we're graduating 90 percent of our seniors, but our higher ed people are telling us that over 75 percent of the students going into higher ed require remedial courses. Mm -hmm. So we really have to drill down backwards on this to look at how we're going to solve education. And then when you throw COVID on top of it, the kids left two months early last year. So instead of having the three month summer slide that all teachers know the kids have, we've got a five month slide. And we're starting to see the data come in. I just received the data from uh, Director Hickman in Murray County that the biggest increase of learning loss happened in our first graders in Murray County to where now we were 28% of our, our, our first graders were in tier three students, which are the most far behind. That number has now jumped to 48%. Wow. 
the reason why it's jumped to 48% for those new first graders is because right about the time in kindergarten, they were starting to get it in March, we sent them all home. So those first graders right now are very far behind. One of the things we're looking at to help this out is to not have statewide testing this year, to allow our teachers, instead of preparing the middle of March until the test period in May, to prepare for a test, we just want them to keep teaching these kids for an extra two months. And then look at a summer school program for this year for the tier three students or tier, th or tier two students who are behind to try to get them caught up so when they enter the 21-22 school year that, that they have the best chance of being successful. And then lastly is funding. Um, schools are, ve are very concerned with the amount of students that have been taken out for homeschooling um, that they may not return in the BEP formula, they could be shorted a lot next year. So one of the bills that I'm going to mm. hopefully carry next year is called the School Stabilization Act, where our schools will get the exact same amount of money in the BEP that they receive next year. They're, they'll get this, or uh, this year, they'll get it for next year also. So that'll stabilize our, our BEP, where the school boards are going to know that the money is going to show up. Even if those kids don't come back, they're still going to have that money there that they can count on. And that might give us the opportunity over the next year, Kara, to transition to a new BEP formula, the basic education program that people have been talking about we need to, to take a look at. That would give us a whole year because we already know what the schools are going to get for the 21-22 school year. So that would give our Department of Education a whole year to come up with a new funding formula. Because if, if, if virtual doesn't go away, we're going to have to account for that in the new in the new funding formula. So a lot of stuff on the horizon in education. Uh, d d discipline has to be brought back into our classrooms. So there's a lot of stuff in the education committee. We were right there in March, ready to start to put uh, down down on uh, to the LEAs that most of it was at their request to help make their classrooms better, to provide teachers more time to spend time teaching instead of collecting data and, and analyzing students, just teach the students. And that's what we're gonna to try to get back to, especially in early ed. Perfect, perfect. Thanks so much for your insight on that. Um, and, and as a parent, and both of us being parents, you know, education is something uh, near and dear to us and to our entire community and our entire economy. Mm -hmm. Something that obviously just like broadband is not gonna go away, so. Right. Okay, well, we're moving right through this. So, um, talking about COVID and sort of the impact of COVID on our community. Our local economy has seen some businesses do very well, um, while some others uh, may have struggled uh, even or even closed uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, what is your plan uh, to continue economic uh, recovery efforts uh, in our district? So in Murray County and District 64. Well, you know, in March, you know, the, the revenue we were looking at in the state of Tennessee was pushing about $42 billion. When COVID hit, we readjusted the budget in March to cut $1 billion out. And then when we came back later on in June, we cut an additional billion dollars out in, 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 in revenue. Now, when people talk about revenue at the state level, um, that funds a lot of the programs that filter on down to the county, such as in Murray County, the school's budget is $103 million. The, the, the Department of Education, the state, and the federal government provides $71 million of that. Mm -hmm. So Murray County's portion is about 30 million, 30 million, give or take a few million of the budget. In March, Murray County was unsure where the revenue sources were gonna be. Now it looks like from talking to D Doug Luconan that Murray County is pretty much stabilized and to the fact that they're ahead of budget, not even in Murray County, but also our, our local cities are doing fairly well too. We see what happens on first Friday on the square, it's starting to come back. Life is returning to normal, not the new normal, Kara, but normal. Yeah. Um, you know, we provided over $71 million for, for broadband uh, to our rural communities. And then the General Assembly kicked in another 20, so now over $90 million for providers that help to expand broadband. Um, you know, when we, when we left in March, we didn't know what this virus was gonna look like. We were yeah. told two to three million people were gonna die in the United States. And so we took appropriate action to help mitigate that. Uh, Governor Lee made some very unpopular decisions about closing things down. But I think it, it hindsight's 2020, probably did the right thing. But you know as well as I do, when we get past this pandemic, 
um, we're going to be able to go back and armchair quarterback this and have better decisions for if this ever comes around again. Uh, I believe that what Governor Lee did with opening up all businesses and, and, re, and uh, uh, taking away the restrictions on how many people can go into restaurants or how many people can be in church, I think that was a huge step forward in getting our economy back online. But here's the problem. 89 counties are basically, basically back to normal. But the big four and basically the big six are not. And that's what's crippling our economy right now in Tennessee. We've got to get Nashville chattanooga memphis and knoxville back online and then once we get those back online then we're going to see the big robust economic engine come back to tennessee which is going to allow the general assembly to do the things that we need to do to provide better services for our for our citizens um, ongoing here the quicker we can get this covid 19 behind us we're all praying for a vaccine as quick as it can get here mm -hmm. the most important thing about the vaccine care is it has to be your choice yeah. Whether, whether or not you want to take it or not is up to you. Um, you know, Mayor Ogles, I think, has done a very good job of communicating the informa information to the people of Murray County. Um, and I think he's made some ver very good decisions on how, how to keep the county open, and he's taken some heat for it. But I think it's put Murray County in a position to come out of this as the leaders that we should be in Tennessee, and I look forward to that, to, to that day. Yeah. Any predictions on when you think maybe the uh, the big four will be 100 percent open, uh, their economy will be 100 percent back to somewhat normal? Well, I mean, um, obviously, when there's a vaccine out there for sure, um, or possibly November 4th. OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard a lot of speculation about the, the election. Um, as well. So. Well, this is one of my favorite questions, um, and I think that this gives us and the viewer an opportunity to really know about you um, and, and, and why you're running and, and why you want to serve. So what issue, uh, and if there's more than one, that's okay, um, what are you most passionate about and how would it affect uh, Murray County? So what, what makes you get up every day and say, wow, we've got to keep whittling away at this? The incarceration budget in, in, in the state of Tennessee, the Department of Corrections has just eclipsed $1.1 billion. Wow. Um, I just got a study back from the Department of Corrections before March 15th, before COVID hit, there were 428 inmates taken into the Department of Corrections prisons. And they screened those for literacy. Those 428 inmates on reading were at a first grade level and math was at a third grade level. It is education. Education creates the opportunity for people to be successful, Karen. We have got to demand. We've got to demand that our kids know how to read, write, and do math by third grade. If they can do that, if we can accomplish that task, that will transform four through 12 and then higher education. Mm -hmm. Where those students will have opportunity to choose what they want to do in life, to be successful in life, to either be doctors or lawyers or electricians or plumbers. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest sector that's retiring right now that we have to address is the generation that built it or fix it in Tennessee and in our country. And we've got to get back to this mentality that there are two paths to success in life. One is a four-year four degree, and the other one is either through a trade school or, for, or through a community college. Uh, we're trying to find $47 million right now for Columbia State to build their, their nursing facility. Mm -hmm. The nurses. Those, those skills, those community college uh, certificates or those, or those uh, um, uh, TCAT uh, certificates, that's what's going to drive our economy. That's what's going to drive the success. And everything that it focuses on is K-3 through literacy rates. And if we, that is my main focus up here in the General Assembly has been on education. We've got to fix that. And if we fix that, our, our corrections budget goes down. Our 10 care budget goes down. Our drug addiction, our alcoholism, our, our gang violence, right? All the things that people do because of bad choices are going to go down. And there's, and there's statistics across the country to prove that. Mm -hmm. So my main focus up here, the thing that gets me up in the morning care at 4.30 in the morning is education and it's the importance that we have to 
make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get the best education that we can provide for them in the safest classroom with the best teachers. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a second on that. So, um, and I know that you've been working on this um, as, as state representative already, but if you are elected, how do you intend to stay informed uh, on matters of importance with your constituents? So how, do you, how do you intend to uh, maintain communication and stay connected with your constituents here in District 64? Well, um, there's always Facebook, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. There's always these Zoom calls that we do. Uh, people know that I'm, I try to attend all the events that I can, I can attend. I've seen you over at the Ribbon Cuttings a lot in the coffees. Um, when normal life does return, and all of the, uh, the fish fries and the barbecues and the church socials all open back up, my job as a representative is to serve the people of Murray County. My job is to make myself accessible to you. My job is to listen to what you want to do. And I'll, I'll give you a great example. Last year, I was working with education and I visited all of the elementary schools in Murray County. And I sat down with all the elementary school teachers and I said, tell me how to fix it. And Kara, they did. And I carried 13 bills up here last year that had all their suggestions in them. And we had nine of them that were ready to go to the house floor before COVID hit. That's, that's how the system works is having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with Will about things at the Alliance that they pop up with judges. I passed a bill about magistrate judges, judges that came from our magistrates in Murray County. They said, hey, we need you to fix this. And we fixed it. That's how it's supposed to work. And I think by keeping those lines of communication, one, uh, the people of Murray County know that their representative is, is, is representing what their values and views are because their representative takes the time to listen to them. And that's the job that I have, and I enjoy serving the people of Murray County. Thank you. Thanks. That was, that was uh, an excellent answer. Excellent, excellent philosophy, for sure, because communication is, is so key. So just sort of in closing, and we've had some really, really good discussion, if you want to talk about what you perceive as maybe the three most important issues facing Murray County uh, in, the near, in the nearest future, uh, or anything else that you want to address that maybe we haven't talked about uh, during this interview so far? Well, being Murray County specific, and I'm glad you asked that question, I think uh, the big thing we're going to have is uh, schools. We're going to have to perform better in our schools, and I know Director Hickman has that on his mind along with the school board and uh, Chairman Fulbright, Chairman Fulbright over there. Um, I, I think they're going to they're going to do a really good job. I try to talk to Director Hickman on a weekly basis just to find out if there's anything that he needs to communicate to me or I need to communicate to them. So I think education is going to play a big role. Um, I also think our infrastructure is getting more and more taxed by our population. Mm -hmm. uh, we know next uh, sp next spring, early spring, they're going to start the construction on the Bear Creek Interchange. Um, that's going to be a three year T dot project. And while we're there, I know Senator Hensley, myself, and Representative Curcio continue to urge and cajole and to push TDOT that while they're there to expand Bear Creek four lane to the interstate, which could create an economic corridor for our county and, and better mm -hmm. access in and out of, of Southern Middle Tennessee. And then lastly, I, we talked about it on the first thing is broadband. Um, there are a lot of citizens around Murray County because of the way the um, topography of Murray County is with the hills and the valleys that they don't have internet access and that's gonna that's gonna that's gonna hurt us as we try to develop and expand Murray County with attracting more businesses here um, if we can push them further out like down towards Cherry Glen or maybe a business relocate out out in Hampshire that will help generate more more jobs for those for those economies or up in Santa Fe then then it starts mm -hmm. to spread wealth so to speak throughout Murray County and people don't have to spend so much time on the road driving to and from work. And they can spend more time in their families. They can spend more time at, at first Fridays on the square or come to coffee that, that you're going to do. That's what, that's why Murray County is so attractive to people, Kara, is when you yeah. sit around on first Fridays and you listen to the conversations of just friends having, that's what people long for is that old nostalgia of yesteryear that has left us because of the hustle and bustle of life. Mm -hmm to keep Murray County like that, which will keep Murray County growing. Yeah, I totally agree. I hear it all the time. I hear yep. it. We are very attractive and I think the growth is just going to continue. So, all right. Well, Scott, is there anything else that you want to leave us with uh, 
today. Maybe you want to remind um, our viewers of when uh, uh, early voting starts. <laughs> early voting will start October uh, October 14th. Yeah, uh, it'll run. It'll run for about two weeks, and then election day is November 3rd. Um, however, you're going to vote. Get out and vote. There are yes. men and women. There are men and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice for yes. our liberty and freedoms. At least do them the honor of showing up to vote and voting for whoever, whichever candidate you're going to vote for. But do them the honor of saying thank you for their service to our country and go vote. Yes. So we we do uh, encourage folks to go vote. And also want to point out that uh, in addition to these candidate interviews that we're doing for our state representatives, we are also uh, we also have a uh, candidate guide for many of the other uh, elected officials that will be on the ballot on November the 3rd. So you can check out our candidate guide uh, on our website, which is murrayalliance.com. Uh, or if you have any trouble, just feel free to call uh, call us or stop by. But um, we are we are trying our our darndest and our hardest to make sure that uh, uh, viewers who are interested can be informed and and make an informed choice when they go to the polls. So we encourage you to um, look at those uh, candidate guides. And Scott, again, I want to thank you very much for your time. I know that uh, you're you stay very very busy. And we appreciate you taking the opportunity to uh, let our viewers uh, get to know you uh, as a representative of district and candidate for District 64. My pleasure to serve, Karen. All right. Have a great rest of the day, and thanks so much. Thank you, Karen.